let's make a start. This morning I uh, woke up, got my usual uh, dose of news and so on, and saw this particular article. Talking, and of course, I was triggered to read it because of the supply chain um, ideas that we we're reading about last week. And it's a really, really interesting article that again picks up some of those elements of change that we that we're focused on. Um, I've sent a message out about it with the link to the particular article. Um, I really commend it as, a, as an interesting read about that helps explain that helps us understand certainly they certainly the academics being interviewed here link neoliberal changes 30 40 years ago and they actually, they actually suggest it starts in Japan um, but they're certainly linking some of those sort of shifts towards efficiency and away from big state into private sort of worlds to um, a very thin supply chain that is really being exposed currently which helps explain some of the um, well, it helps explain something like going into JB Hi-Fi maybe on the weekend to try and buy myself a, a desktop computer and they had none in the state. Extraordinary kind of circumstances. Um, helps explain, it won't certainly be explaining it completely. Um, good, to, good to see you all again and, um, and to, know that, to know that you're here. Can I just point you to the chat uh, function? Um, and I just um, have put in a few notes there about what's going on today. Can I also just check, maybe you can just put your thumbs up or, or something like that or down. Um, did you get the message that I just sent out? Have you been, do you have access? I've just sent an email, um, I believe, I hope. Did I or not? No, you, did you get it? Yes? Yep, you have received it. Okay, so that contains some questions, some multiple choice questions that I think it's going to be easier for what I want to do initially, if you've got that in front of you, you've got those in front of you, I'm going to send you into, into group rooms. Let me explain that in a few minutes. Um, so there's some, um, there's some notes that I put in the chat function, which just reflect what's in the multiple choice, um, it, just in that handout I've just sent you anyway. Um, Sorry, uh, Martin, just to interrupt, I can't see anything on the chat. Is it... Are you? Can't you? Sorry, neither can I. I think it's because we joined later after you posted it. We can't see it. Oh, is that oh. right? Oh my god. Okay. I also These... can't see it. Can't see it. So you can only see it. How weird. I did. I had no idea about that. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll post again. <laughs> um. Um. Identify name and describe major forms. All right, well, that's what we're aiming to do today. I was just also saying today we're obviously using rural WA as an example, thinking about connecting major social change in the global north to social outcomes and identifying, naming and describing. So thank you for that lesson. Don't, pre don't prep too much is, is one of the things there. And the other limiting thing about using the Zoom, uh, using the chat is uh, there is a limitation to the number of words I can actually copy in. Um, so identifying name describing major forms of socio-political economic change over the course of the 20th century into the present and linking these to social outcomes. Of course, if we're not focused in and around what happens to people, then I don't believe that we're really doing sociology or anthropology. And I, I remember here uh, one, of the, one of the quotes I love uh, to cite um, from quite a well-known anthropologist talking about how anthropology, sociology is philosophy with the people in it. And it always strikes me as, as a, a very helpful way to think about what I'm doing anyway. Before, <coughs> before I go any further, I just I wanted to invite, uh, I got a little bit of uh, feedback from Callum last week, Callum McCall, who was just talking about, you know, when you go into these small groups and he's basing this on experience from last semester. Callum, do you just want to share a couple of your thoughts about when you go into the chat rooms? Sure. Well, the, the first thing that I noticed is it, it makes a really big difference um, in your ability to engage with people if they have their cams turned on. Yep. Um, if, if their cams are off, then it's like they're not a real person. <laughs> they're just a little name on the screen. Um, and so I think like, it doesn't really matter if you have your cam off like now when we're just in this big room, but um, when we go into the breakout rooms, I think it's, yeah. it's really good to have them on. Um, and I know some people like don't have webcams and stuff, but you know, you can use like your phone or whatever um, for Zoom. Yeah, yeah, but not um, everybody's got that advantage. We do have to acknowledge that. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, and then the other thing that um, 
I think makes for the most interesting discussion is when there's like follow-up questions being asked by other people, because I think it's very easy to just like repeat something that you heard in a lecture or that you read in something. But then if someone asks you like, Oh, well, why do you think that? Or what about this? What about that? Then it kind of forces you to, to think on the fly and actually sort of justify why you, why you think that or why you don't. Mm. Um, and it's just, it's just more interesting than just like, here's my spiel. Here's your spiel. Here's this person's spiel. I think actually having that interaction is a lot more um, enjoyable and interesting. Yep. And the other thing that you were talking about is um, copying down the, the questions, taking a, a photograph or taking some sort of um, copy of the, the questions that are posed. Callum made the point to me that dropping questions in on you by, by command from above can be distracting to the conversation. And if that's the case, then I'll stop doing that and I'll try and prep it as best I can before you go in. And then maybe one of the other ways to do that is just try and capture the questions yourself before you go landing into those rooms. Now, I do want to plunge you into the rooms. I've got to tell you, that's the metaphor that I, I keeps coming to mind for me is when I put people into these um, chat groups and I put you into the, uh, the rooms, um, I feel like I'm dropping you somewhere. It's a <laughs> and of course, it's a strange kind, but just how it feels as I'm doing it. So you may hear me using that kind of metaphorical language as we go. What I would like you to do I hope that at least one of you has access to the multiple choice questions, but it's better if you all do. And what I want you to do is to address the first three on that on the list that I have just sent around. Um, um, so the first one that's uh, looking at, um, you know, a description of a particular historical period, the ideas of Milton Keynes and uh, neoliberal reform. And the idea here is not just to get the answer right, but it's to actually work out you know, just be confident of it. So the thing that I was wondering that might be helpful is to work out which are the best two alternatives and really decide why it is. I mean, in some cases, it's just a straight knowledge thing. I'm, I don't want to get too fancy about that. But what I just want to do now is, there's uh, 40, 41 of you, is just drop you into um, groups of um, uh, fours, I think think something like that and um, and create the rooms for you have a look at those questions and I'll call uh, and do it in about five minutes I'll call you back up in about five minutes there you go you can hear the analogy call you back up um, see you see you in about five
<coughs> Hi, Rachel. Have you just have you just come out of the room, or are you trying to? Are you muted? No. Yes, your volume, your sound's not working. Okay. Ah, damn. That makes it hard to be in a room. Okay, I'll leave you to try and sort that out. These damn technical problems. Huh. I'm calling everybody back up in a moment, but. Um, And I'll just throw another question at you whilst people come back into the into the room. See how you go with that one. Life's full of multiple choice questions.
as you're coming back in, I've just thrown another multiple choice question at you because that's all life. That's all it is. So. And to just reiterate the point that these are the sorts of questions, you know, these are kind of questions of, of fact and terminology, just trying to get you to get on top of some of the terminology of the discipline that it's pointing to. The richer thing to do is to be able to converse in it, which is then the rest of the point of this particular workshop. Now, let's just see, where are we at? I think just about everybody's back. Let me... Um, let me, I'm wondering, my screen is playing up at the moment and I'm not sure if it's going to make this impossible or not. Um, I'm not sure then how that translates. Is that difficult to read? The screen I've just shared with you? It's fine for you. Seems okay. Yep. All right. So it's clear for you, but it's, it's, I've got to tell you, it looks like I've, it feels like I've got a migraine the way I'm seeing it. So it's all very blurry to me. All right. So the first one then. Um, um, <laughs> already hinted at it. It seemed to me, I, if we were to struggle over two questions, it might be, is this modernity or is this enlightenment? If we were to do that, maybe the Industrial Revolution could also be a reasonable distractor there. Um, and I'm not polling it, so I'm not trying to find that out, but just to clarify then, the, the answer is modernity. That's what it's describing, and it's coming straight out of one of the readings anyway of last week. Uh, and I'm not going to go through the, the business of working out, you know, is that okay? Um, I'm assuming and hoping that the conversation helped you sort out a few things there. Milton Keynes, back in the news, um, well and truly, he disappeared for a while. Um, a, a pre and post Second World War economist. Um, now, most readily associated with the ideas of, of his is the welfare state. Um, now, whether or not he actually was a proponent of the welfare state is a very, very debatable point. But certainly the development of the welfare state, particularly the post-war versions of it, are often largely attributed to him. And which of the following is not generally considered a characteristic of neoliberal reform? Farm subsidies. Um, the rest of them are all um, very much a part of what people are terming neoliberal um, tend to do. Can I just point out to you something that's worth knowing? I think are worth being aware of as you read this. The people who tend to use the term neoliberal tend to be very critical of it. Those, um, those, of, um, those who are more, um, um, who are keener on the kinds of market reform that, uh, and the supply side economics um, do, tend to, do tend to portray themselves, do tend to portray it in very different ways, a kind of libertarian approach or whatever. Now, going back to the one we just polled, the major ways in which humans organise their production of foods and goods describe, best describes which of the following? Well, most of you are going for mode of production. Um, a few different uh, distractors um, getting, getting you in. It's, um, it's got very little to do with globalisation. If you actually look at the question, it's not suggesting anything about it being a, a, a global phenomenon. There is a level of social organisation in it, but it's a particular type of social organisation and it's not, it's, not, it's not describing capitalism in any specific kind of a way. I mean, it would, to be capitalism, uh, it would, well, has anybody got any thoughts on what it would need to be to be a capitalist mode of production? Um, the mode of production is owned by the elite capitalists mm. and people yeah. sell their labour. Yeah, the means of production is owned by the, the capitalists and then people selling their labour into it. Yeah, that's right. So this is describing modes of production more generally. Just uh, getting to that. All right, so our main focus is on uh, WA, the, the reading, uh, but, yeah, got a few years in it, but at the same time, I think, think it still speaks to uh, many of the issues taking place in, uh, in the wheat belt of WA. We've already had a, a comment from one of, our, uh, one, one of the group. Let me get out of here, stop share. Um, <coughs> pointing out that uh, different parts of WA different things are happening. It depends upon what people are using the land for. But in productive landscapes, such as the wheat belt, um, there are, um, and agricultural landscapes, there are things going on, things, changes happening. But let's also just imagine, let's just remember and recall and know that um, this is a fairly recent development on this particular land. And prior to this, there were, of course, the Noongar people, um, as we now know they are referred to, it took us a while to get, um, to took us, took um, people who are part of the settler colon colonization process. 
um, time to come to grips with some of that. Um, so let, I mean, let's just try to imagine what's happened to indigenous people over the period of population of that wheat belt area and um, the kind of stories that, uh, or the, well, the kind of stories and the, the very real social effects that that's had, the disruption that's had on a, another mode of production, kinship based, um, kinship -based production, um, and uh, certainly not now none of it being produced for markets or profit, uh, for trade, for establishing relationships and things like that. Um, a way of life that um, gather a hunter, um, for the most part. I mean, there's challenges to those images at the moment going on. Um, but it is worth us keeping in mind some of the shifts that happened. And gather hunter lifestyles are not compatible with agricultural lifestyles. And so what starts to happen, and it's, it's predictable in a way, is that the um, people um, living previously on the land and trying to still sustain that kind of way of life are curtailed in all sorts of ways and they get controlled in all sorts of different ways. And if you know that history well enough, you will know that something like the Aboriginal Protection Act um, said to be protecting Aboriginal people was mainly protecting the interests of um, of, of farming and, and other and other activities. So Aboriginal people get shepherded, herded into um, mission stations, into reserves, into camps, um, on the fringes of society, um, pauperised in in all sorts of ways. So whereas before all the needs were more or less met, they were finding it much harder to do that. They were not able to extract the um, their, their sustenance from the land and the differences that those kind of things make. And then you had a whole legal system come in over the top. Um, you know, the removal of children, I think that story is well documented. I'm not going to go into all of the ins and outs of that. But if you look at West Australian Parliament Hansards at the time, or Australian Parliament as well, well no, it's state governments doing these things. The West Australian Hansard was actually talking about how they were addressing the Aboriginal problem, as they were calling it. Um, ideas that it, this, uh, that it was about people working in the best interest of everyone is fanciful to say the least. There was a real sense that Aboriginal people will die out eventually and um, this is a way of just smoothing the dying pillow was one way, one expression that was around a lot in those particular periods. But Aboriginal people were denied access to, for, to schooling, to state schooling. Um, they were uh, in many instances, certainly in, this, in the larger towns in, in this particular city of Perth, um, not allowed out after night. There was a curfew unless they had, a, as they call it, a, a dog collar, a dog tag, uh, which indicated some level of, of uh, rights to some form of citizenship uh, if they were in the special chosen mob. But otherwise, they were not allowed to do that. They had to get permission from the Aboriginal protector to get married. You know, so there was all of these kinds of rules and regulations coming in over the top of this that uh, we need to keep in mind. And it's very obvious, you know, that in this particular paper, that those voices are not there. You can't get everything into a paper when you're writing it. We have to keep that in mind. But we just need to make sure that we don't whitewash um, the stories we tell as well, to be aware of that. Okay, what, I've, what I want to do now is to plunge you back into, um, into a discussion where we're going to pick up, using the Tonts and, and Jones paper, to, to put some flesh around some of the ideas I want to um, I want to just throw in, and what I will do is put into the into the chat just um, some of the key concepts that I think you should be looking to use, and um, and um, but what I want to what I want you to really do uh, now is to um, is is to just spend a bit of time gathering together your, your thoughts about this, developing the narrative that helps capture some of this history of, the, um, of what we've come to know as the Global North, some of the major social changes and their social implications. Um, so picking up on the Thompson Jones paper, identify, name and describe some of the major changes uh, in rural WA in the past 190 years or so, um, with particular emphasis on the second half of this 20th century into the now and linking them to social outcomes. So I'll just put that into the chat uh, now. Uh, hopefully I've got, I've got enough words to work with here. My screen is getting out of control, I've got to say. Um, so I'm hoping I'm gonna be able to stay with you as well. Um, 
no, no, I'm not sending it to Rachel. I'm sending it to everyone. I beg your pardon. Okay, um, so identify naming and change those sort of things. And what I will also do is put into the chat function um, some of the keywords that I believe you should be using in doing this. And, um, oh dear me, I, I'll tell you, I may even, I can't end the meeting, can I? Um, but I've got some real problems on my screen here. And I'm hoping I'm going to be able to just keep it going. I do apologize if, uh, mm. Mm. Um, I'll take you back to the same rooms yeah, that you were just in. And following that up then folks, um, just opening up the discussion around that, bringing in the ideas, tracing the history, doing it as systematically as you, as you, as you can, and just capturing some of the terms, the key phrases that are part of this particular conversation. Is that clear enough? Good luck. Yeah, have a go. The idea here is to become kind of literate in this particular thing, to be able to talk about it and to have the kind of terms at your fingertips. I'm opening the rooms now. Martin, you may want to check if you have a loose cable, like if, if the display cable mm. on your computer no. is much as loose. <clears throat> No, it's not that actually, but yeah, okay. thanks. Yeah. I'll, I'll drop in from time to time when I get the chance. You still there, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, it's just my machine is crazy. It's jumping all over the place. It's a nightmare as well. Um, mm, I need a new one. <laughs> You okay, Yasmin? Oh, uh, I got locked out somehow. <laughs> okay, so I need to Sorry. reallocate. I'll yeah. reallocate you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you hear my, my vocals at the moment? Yes, we can. Yay! Okay, so it might be the headset. I need to replace the headset then. <laughs> um, so Yasmin, who am I assigning you to? What were you in, Yasmin? Do you remember? Um, no, I don't remember what the number was. The key okay, I'll, was it, but... um, I'll send you to 10. I was in three, if that helps. Okay. Yep. And you Thank go. Thank you. Thanks. No worries.
area were already struggling because they weren't producing as much as they used to and not contributing to the economy as much and then also compounding with that they didn't have enough access to like public services that they might need um and that sort of just yeah, yeah mm -hmm. follow-on effect mm -hmm. 